I'm Craig Gent, North of England editor at Navarra Media, and on the 21st of September, I'll be joined by Navarra's co-founder, Aaron Bistani, at How the Light Gets In, the annual festival of ideas at Kenwood House in London. We'll be talking about the promise and danger of the algorithm, the technological and social force that organises what we see online, but not only that, the force that is increasingly organising our workplaces and many other aspects of society. It's a question I explore in my new book, Cyberboss, The Rise of Algorithmic Management and the New Struggle for Control at Work. But we'll also be talking about culture, politics, and whether we're beginning to see a rejection of the technology that organises life online. Join us on Saturday the 21st of September at How the Light Gets In, alongside some world-leading thinkers, politicians, philosophers, scientists and artists, including the likes of Carla Denya, Sadiq Khan and Gary Stevenson. If you're listening to this, you can get a 20% discount on festival tickets. Head over to howthelightgetsin.org and enter the exclusive promo code NML24 for discounted tickets. We hope to see you there. Emmanuel Hagland, better known to history as Joe Hill, was a songwriter and an activist. He was an itinerant worker on the docks and the railways of turn of the century America and a member of the union, the Industrial Workers of the World. It was a time of sharp contradiction between organised workers and the police. Eventually, in 1914, Joe Hill was hauled up before the courts and then convicted, many people think flimsily and falsely, on a murder charge. He was executed by firing squad on November the 19th of 1915 at Utah's Sugar House Prison. But before he was killed, he reportedly cautioned his friend not to focus his energies on grief. Don't mourn, organise, he said. Another organiser at the time, Mary Harris Jones, or Mother Jones, had in 1902 been called the most dangerous woman in America for her role in organising child labourers and miners and mill workers for better conditions. She had a different take to Joe Hill. She commanded us to pray for the dead and fight like hell for the living. In a time of mass crisis, when catastrophes come piling in on top of one another, Sometimes it seems like there's barely time to count the dead, let alone mourn them. And we are left with questions about grief. How do we think about the victims of capitalism's many horrors? How do we remember them, use their stories, carry their legacy forward? What does grief teach us? And how does it change us as individuals and as a collective? And what do we owe to those who have gone before? Sarah Jaffe is a writer and journalist whose works include Necessary Trouble, Americans in Revolt, and Work Won't Love You Back, How Devotion to Our Jobs Keeps Us Exploited, Exhausted and Alone. Her latest book is From the Ashes, Grief and Revolution in a World on Fire. It explores a political history of grief and mourning, from COVID to climate change, from migration to police violence to the ongoing genocide in Palestine. We talked about abolition, about deindustrialization, about collective care, and what we can learn from ghosts. Sarah, hi, welcome. Uh, Hello, it's good to be here. Yeah, I'm so glad to have you physically with us in the studio so I can look you directly in the eye and tell you how much this book fucked me up, right? It's like, it's (laughs) very intimate, it's very personal. Of course, it's a book about grief, right? And You've worked as a reporter, as an investigative journalist for many years now. And so I'm left wondering really, what was it like putting together this much more personal, much more raw form of work and reporting? It was terrifying. Mm -hmm. Um, I also feel compelled to note that the last time I was in the studio, and in fact, the time that you and I met in person, (laughs) was a night of a lot of grief for all of us, which is election night, British election night 2019. 
Um, so <laughs> that's bringing up some some grief filled memories for me right now. Yeah, strap in. It's going to be an intensive therapy session for all yeah, concerned. Yeah, yeah. And look at me dodging the question about writing about myself. Right. <laughs> <laughs> See, that's what they told me to do. Yeah. Um, no, it's 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 terrifying to write about myself. I'm very used to writing about other people, and was very bad at sort of wanting to write about myself. I kind of felt like I had to. I write a little bit in the introduction about like I I didn't sort of put myself on the page because I feel like my story is so important so much as the fact that like I couldn't go around interviewing all of these people about like the worst things that ever happened to them without being willing to share the things that happened to me, even though most of the people that I interview for this book have been through a lot more than I ever have. It felt like voyeuristic and journalism is often kind of voyeuristic. Mm -hmm. So so trying to like have some ethics about it, weirdly in this case, involved doing a thing that journalistic ethics often tells you not to do, which is writing about yourself. You've talked about um, grief as a structure of feeling that kind of gives us a viewpoint onto a lot of historical and contemporary processes that we're unfortunately living through right now. Uh, but there's a lot of um, different tendrils of uh, connections between grief specifically and other things like, I don't know, heartbreak or rage or despair. So what yeah. is it about grief specifically that drew you to this topic? Yeah, it's interesting, right? Because I, I will often say that like grief isn't a feeling, it's kind of all the feelings. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. And giving advice to a friend recently when, when they had a friend pass away and was just like, you know, the, the best advice someone gave me about grief was like, whatever you were feeling is okay. Mm -hmm. And that is advice that I pass on all of the time. Uh, that was from the lovely Joshua Eaton, who's one of the people this book is dedicated to. And so it's, you know, almost a cop out to say grief is a structure of feeling that we're all living in because that encompasses so much. But I think we're in this moment where like, you know, the planet is dying. Um, the politics just keep getting sort of more depressing and like oddly more depressing even when like the worst thing doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. um, and when we get the, you know, sort of starmerism, Kamala Harrisism, you know, just like p putting a cop in charge of your nominally progressive party is a great idea, guys. <laughs> we like that feels almost more depressing than like the horrible guys winning because then like we at least know who to fight when it's the fascists, right. you know, but like a lot of people that like I respect and care about are kind of feeling really like relieved and, and happy about Kamala Harris and I just can't right now, you know? Um, so there's there's that aspect of it. There's the fact that we just, you know, came through and came through with like big air quotes around it because like feels like half the people I know have had COVID in the last month, um, but came through, you know, years of real mass death from this pandemic that is now um, killing fewer people, although still disabling a lot of people and making a lot of people ill. Um, there's a genocide that's been going on for most of a year now. And before that, still, we were sort of living in the shadow of the forever war. And so much of this stuff, like, it still goes on. We just sort of stop talking about it. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean that everybody's, like, processed it and is happy. It means that we're all sort of walking around with unacknowledged trauma all the time. And, you know, the trauma has become, like, such a buzzword and, and almost a cliche at this point. It's really hard to talk about. But talking about grief um, is less common, I think, and and so felt like a useful angle into things. And then also, just frankly, like after my father died, I just started seeing grief in everything that I was writing about. Mm. Tell me more about that. So there's a story in the book that I, I tell about going to Lordstown, Ohio, to report on the closure of the famous Lordstown General Motors plant. And Dave Green, who was the um, president of the local, the United Auto Workers local at the time, he's now the regional director in that area, sort of comes in while I'm interviewing his vice president, Tim O'Hara, and just like flops on the couch in the office and looks at me and goes, you know, they say there's seven stages of grief, but we can't go through them because we're sort of trapped in the middle because they won't tell us what's going on with the plant. And I was like, right, that's what's happening with all these factory closures. And that's what happening is happening with sort of the ghosts of the factory and the ghosts of the mine having surfaced in like 2016, 2017, 2018, 2019, um, the red wall discourse, right? The 
the ghosts of the industrial worker were everywhere. And it hadn't occurred to me to see it as a form of grieving until he said that. And it was suddenly entirely obvious, right? But Mm -hmm. it turns out people know what they're going through and they can narrate it very clearly to you. Yeah. And it was like, oh, and suddenly this piece that I'd been struggling with since sort of, I was going to say the rise of Trumpism, but actually since like the Tea Party, you know, is really when I was thinking about it. And I was, I've been going through old articles for a variety of reasons recently. And so I was reading stuff that I'd written about the Tea Party. And I was reading stuff that I'd written about um, hilariously Rick Santorum running for president in 2012. Oh, that's a deep cut. (laughs) I mean, special. (laughs) Yeah. And my editor at the time sort of not wanting me to write about him and be like, he's a nothing, he's going to go away. And then he won three Rust Belt states. And I was like, can I write about it now? Because it was the thing that became Trumpism, right? It was this sort of resentment-based politics aimed at a certain kind of white working class masculinity. And that was everywhere. And I was, you know, writing about it because it was obviously fascinating and obviously everybody writes about it badly, almost everybody. And then it occurred to me like, okay, people are grieving. And then I was like, what are what are we actually grieving when you grieve the factory? What are you actually grieving when you grieve the coal mine? Because these forms of work are not particularly pleasant. They're not a lot of fun. They often kill you either slowly or quickly, especially in the case of mining, which is like a horrifically dangerous industry at the best of times. And so poking at that and going like, okay, people are, are grieving something other than this particular kind of work that won't be brought back just by like reopening a coal mine in Cumbria or whatever Rishi Sunak was saying he was going to do. As a book about grief, it's inevitably also a book about death, right? And I'm curious as to how you would uh, conceptualize things like thanatocracy, necropolitics, all these kinds of words that we use to talk about how capitalism organizes death and yeah. how capitalism kind of is a system which differentiates access to right. the means of life, aka that puts people to death. Right. You know, I, and the first thing that I thought of when I started trying to conceptualize this book was, was Ruth Wilson Gilmore's, you know, definition of racism as a group differentiated um, vulnerability to premature death, right? That like racism is about death. Racism is about unequal dealing of death. We can see this again if we look at Gaza right now, right? It is about who is allowed to be killed, who is grievable in in Judith Butler's framework, right? Um, And the when you're thinking about thanatocracy, which it it comes from, um, oh God, Peter Leinbaugh's brilliant book, The London Hanged, which I only read like when I was almost done with this book and I had to like shoehorn a bunch of things in an edit because I was like, oh my God, that exactly, that's what I was looking for. Um, shout out to my friend Lydia Pello Hobbs, who's a geographer, a grad student of Ruthie Gilmore's Once Upon a Time, actually, and the person who told me to read that book. And she was like, it's a banger. And I was like, it is, in <laughs> fact, a banger. It is one of the best books I've ever read. And right, and, and so he's talking about um, executions at Tyburn at, in the transition to capitalism. And what that tells us about the world, and he he writes that I can't spout it from memory, but the opening paragraph of that book is just, again, one of the best things I've ever read. And he talks about like capital punishment and the punishments of capital. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, that was the bit that I was like, "Uh, that's what I'm trying to write about, right, Is, is the punishments of capital. I'm not really writing that much about capital punishment in this book other than the informal kind dealt out by police all the time. But I am always writing about the punishments of capital. And so sometimes that is actual death. Sometimes I'm talking to people about, you know, people who've been killed by police. Sometimes I'm talking about the genocide in Gaza. Sometimes I'm talking about migration and people who migrated because there's a war in the place that they grew up that they would have happily stayed in otherwise. Or sometimes I'm writing about deindustrialization and the disappearance of everything that had sustained your way of life. Um, Certainly, I write, I write about COVID, and obviously, I write about you know ongoing climate catastrophe. And in all of these ways, right, where we are looking at the way that we are made disposable, that we are made um, vulnerable, that we are made killable, um, or just ungrievable. So sometimes it kills you on purpose. Sometimes it just doesn't care if you die. But either way, it never cares if you die. And so I was as struck by some of the stories um, 
Chucky Dennison, who also used to work at the Lordstown plant, told me about being on the assembly line at one of his factory jobs and somebody having a heart attack next to him and just being sort of yanked out of the way and restart the line. And he doesn't know what happened to this guy. He just has to keep working, you know? And that really stuck with me as as a way to understand that like this thing doesn't care if you die. And then during COVID, I think that got brought home to all of us, mm -hmm. right? That, um, you know, I, I say this over and over again when people would ask me questions about work during COVID because my last book came out during lockdown and it was about work. And I was just like, look, like I could have told you like intellectually before this that like capitalism doesn't care if we die. But a lot of people have just had a real visceral experience that their boss doesn't care if they die. The government doesn't care if they die. The entire system doesn't care if you die as long as the money keeps coming in and as you know, long as Jeff Bezos adds a few more zeros to the end of his uh, net worth. You have this framework of um, sacrifice zones, yeah. Yeah. right? Um, either metaphorical or literal, like geographical yeah. terrains yeah. in which um, those forces that you've just described are at a certain peak and pitch. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering how you zeroed in on those examples in particular as, as ways of uh, talking about grief and also using uh, grief to talk about the broader processes of history that we're in at the moment. You've got migration, police violence, mm -hmm. climate change and ecological disruption, yeah. COVID, deindustrialization, the genocide in Gaza. Like there's yeah. so many examples, right? But, yeah. you know, we live in a world of grief, so there could right. be so many more. Right, right. And, and, you know, I'm not a geographer. I've just quoted a few of my favorite ones to you. Um, and, and obviously, like thinking about Ruthie Gilmore's work has been so influential in, in figuring out how to write this book. And there's a wonderful piece that's in the collection, Abolition Geography, on forgotten places mm -hmm. that I really, really loved and, and applied to sort of writing about Louisiana. But yeah, I mean, I, I live in New Orleans when I'm not in London um, or somewhere else on the road. And that is a place that we saw like very publicly made into a sacrifice zone after Hurricane Katrina, right? Which is going to be next year will be 20 years since Katrina. And the anniversary is actually in a week. It's August 29th that Katrina hit. I will be on a plane back to the U.S. And so, you know, that experience, I didn't live there at the time. I had been, I had been to university there. I had moved away in 2002 and Katrina hit in 2005. And I'm like most people watched it on TV. And watching a city that I had lived in sort of go underwater, right? And looking on the TV for like people I knew and, you know, the, the sort of People that make up a life is like the guy at the corner store and the guy who fixed my car and my neighbor whose last name I never learned, but I always chatted to, mm. you know, these people that like, I don't know how to find on Facebook. I wasn't even on Facebook in 2005, whatever we were on, MySpace. You know, I didn't know how to find these people on the internet. I have no idea what happened to any of them, you know, and, and like, first it was a sacrifice zone and then it was a profit zone. So, you know, the public school system is now all privatized in New Orleans. They've just actually reopened one public school, which is amazing. Yeah, nearly 20 years later. <laughs> exactly. One public school. Everything else is a charter school, right? So everything else is privately run and privately controlled and a wonderful place to extract donations from rich jerks. And it's gentrified so much. I moved back two years ago, almost three years ago, and it's changed so much. And luckily, like some of what made it special is still there, but so much of it is gone. And so much of it has been sort of redeveloped. And so I think even before I started thinking about this stuff in, in terminology like sacrifice zones, which has been used by many, many, many people, I had sort of seen it happen, mm -hmm. you know? And so, right, so we have the literal sacrifice zone, like Youngstown, Ohio, which is is just you know, is, has been vacated. Um, it's fallen apart, right? Or former mining village is the same way, right? Or Gaza right now, again, has just been turned into anything. If, you know, if you move, the Israeli army will kill you. And that is like just the, the absolute most obvious example of it that I think we've ever seen, right? Is this, this tiny strip of land, a tiny densely populated strip of land that is just an open kill zone. And no matter how many horrific videos of it we see, we still can't 
even allow a Palestinian to speak at the Democratic National Convention, even though they have a Palestinian member of Congress who just got overwhelmingly re-elected because everybody loves Rashida except for anybody who, you know, she criticizes. Rashida is always right. But the the sacrifice zone sort of exists metaphorically too, right? That I was obsessed with the statistic that early days of of COVID in the U.S., line cooks were the most likely to die of the virus mm. because, you know, restaurants that stayed open and were doing takeaway orders. And so who are most line cooks? Like often they are immigrants, often they are undocumented, often they're making minimum wage, often they are, you know, if you're living in a city like New York and making minimum wage, you are probably sharing an apartment with a lot of people in not a lot of space. And it's really hard, even in the days when we, you know, had masks to stand over a restaurant kitchen sweating and breathing through a mask. Like, of course people got sick and of course people died and probably didn't have access to good health care and all of these things. And so there are like, even in a city like New York, London, Chicago, New Orleans, um, within that there are sacrifice zones that are sort of classed, right, mm -hmm. and raced, that certain parts of the city will get repaired faster than others if something goes to hell. So I live in the French Quarter in New Orleans, and part of my thinking for doing that was that that's the place that they fix first. That's where the power comes back on first. That's where they will worry about the flooding first, because that's where the tourists go. You mentioned Ruthie Gilmore. Um, let's talk a bit about abolition. Yeah. And about the movement for Black Lives that yeah. you um, focus in on in the kind of first chapters of your book yeah. uh, what I'm really struck by is your invocation of um, motherhood and mothers and kind of yes women more generally femmes more generally and um, their role in leading movements and also kind of retooling kind of public discourses around yeah. people who die at the hands of the police by putting forward some kind of sense of like a mournability that isn't conditional on being a perfect angel or mm -hmm. stepping the right side of the law or, you know, all of these kinds of like maddening and, you know, inevitably and purposefully like unfulfillable kinds of forms of conditionality that people are supposed to abide right. by in order to like right, exactly. not have retroactively deserved their own death at the hands of the police. I would love to hear more about, I guess, your experience reporting that and I guess how you're thinking about that, how the people that you are interviewing are thinking about that. Yeah, it's it's really interesting because I, I have a complicated relationship with the concept of family. Um, <clears throat> perhaps people might have noticed that. Mm -hmm. I'm writing a book about the death of my father, among other things. And it is so often women who are leading these movements, right? A um, friend of Navarra, Adam Elliott Cooper, writes about this really beautifully in his book on Black Resistance to British Policing, that it is so often aunts, cousins, mothers – girlfriends, um, I think of Philando Castile's partner who was in the car with him and filmed him getting shot, um, that <laughs> just been through so much. And I, I thought about George Floyd calling for his mother when he was dying, right? And this is, you know, um, <laughs> such a, a horrific thing to have to think about, right? That like, how are you going to behave in front of the cameras to tell you, you know, um, I, I think I quote um, Tamir Rice's mom talking about there's a certain way you have to go in front of the cameras when to tell them, you know, that you want justice for your baby. And like her son was 12, you know. And I imagine like how much of a mess I was after my father died and my father died in his 70s of an illness that we knew, you know, would eventually kill him. I can't imagine having to go in front of cameras because your your 12-year-old child has just been shot by cops and they're saying that somehow he was a threat to them. And you're like, he's 12. Mm. He's 12. He was playing with toys in the park. He's 12. You know, and that that responsibility is is so intense and it's its own form of respectability politics, right? You you not only have to defend the respectability of your child or your cousin or your, you know, father, like Erica Garner, I'm thinking about her, Nylia Stewart, who I sat down with in Memphis, whose cousin Darius was killed by the police in Memphis. But you have to be respectable yourself, right? You have to then be the right kind of mother. And Samaria Rice um, made a real point of this, that like, you know, there, there are people who are better at 
trained at going in front of the media and those people get the donations and they get the support, but like the families are still traumatized at the end of this, you know, and there are certain, there are, are, you know, all sorts of disagreements among the mothers, the families, right? Um, There was a group that called themselves Mothers of the Movement that in 2016, like, endorsed Hillary Clinton. There were others, um, Erica Garner famously endorsed Bernie Sanders, right? There were these, like, sort of fights about, like, who gets to speak for the movement. And all of it is just, like, like, talk about things that are work and things that aren't work. Like, so much that we're asking people to do that gets in the way of being able to just grieve, but then it is a way of grieving also, right? It is a way of of working out what you're feeling, but you have to do it in public and in front of cameras, and it's just such a, a horrific ask. And then, you know, I talked to Miriam Kaba, who is just one of the, you know, organizers that I I turn to over and over again when I can't figure out what I think about something. And I'm like, Miriam, tell me what I should think about this. And, you know, and Miriam is is just an incredibly committed abolitionist. And she's like, you know, sometimes people have demands that I can't go there with, that I'm I'm not going to call for, you know, people to go to jail. This is not what I believe. Um, she worked with the survivors of police torture in Chicago. And they rather understandably wanted the people that had tortured them in jails and prisons to go to prison themselves. And she's like, I can't go there with you, but here's what I can do. And, you know, thinking about the way that there is this complicated relationship, right? Because I am not going to agree with the demands of every family member, of every person who gets killed by police. Sometimes I think that's a bad idea. Sometimes, you know, rather understandably, people have not been political strategists before, you know, and that's fine. But how do you say also, like, your grief is this thing that I can like imagine the contours of, but it's nothing like mine. You get to this sort of intertwined complexity of the role of grief and the role of mm-hmm. imagined vengeance in abolition mm-hmm. politics, because it's, I guess it's about your relationship to time, if I can put it like mm-hmm. that, right? Like mm-hmm. putting someone else in yeah. prison right. is not going to, I mean, like un- rob you or like unassault you or or that kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. I, because I'm really obsessed with like a certain strain of politics that I think is, is really dominant in in certain kinds of liberalism, um, that really wants like to, to turn back the clock in, in a different way than make America great again. But it is related to that kind of thing where like there was a, a real desire when Trump was president the first time and hopefully the only time that, people wanted to be able to like prove that like Russia did it somehow. And therefore that would mean that it had not happened. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right. There, it was this constant or like the push for a second referendum around Brexit. Right. It was like, we want this thing to have not happened. We need to make it not have happened rather than to look in the eye that like a majority of British people voted for Brexit, uh, mostly a majority of English people. Right. Right. In any case, those things happened. That politics exists. And if they had, if it had turned out that like something, something Russian misinformation, that would not have changed the fact that like my parents voted for Trump, mm. which is one of the things I'm struggling with in writing a book about grieving my father. Um, right. My mother will vote for him again this year. My dad's not alive to do it again. So, but if he was, he probably would. So, you know, like I have to deal with that. I cannot like wish it away. I also cannot wish away that my father is dead. I also cannot wish away that like the, you know, relationship I was in when I was, when my father died, fell apart shortly after that. Like those are things that happened that I have to live with. Mm -hmm. And in a lot of cases that I have to make politics with, and I have to figure out what organizing looks like with. And this is why I sort of kept returning to deindustrialization and and will keep returning to deindustrialization probably until I die, that this is central to this rise of a certain kind of nostalgic politics that has turned into Trumpism, into, you know, various rising fascisms. And I think we have to take that really seriously and not sort of wish it undone. And revenge does, you know, it it, it bases itself in the idea that if something bad happens to you, it will have made the thing that happened to me less bad. And it just won't. It doesn't solve the problem. It raises a very thorny question. Of course, it's, it's going to be um, thorny when we're thinking about um, 
responses to and how to hold yeah. the uh, the grief, the pain, the rage, etc., of uh, people to whom massive injustice has right. has been done like right. injustice exactly. that it's it's hard to kind of hold in one word word right. it's hard to yeah. hold in your head right because you're kind of talking about grief both as a structural thing um and as an individual thing in ways that it's, it's sometimes hard to talk yeah. about them together because you're talking right. about like the the ways in which the personal is political but it also right. you know right, exactly. just just kind of wheeling out that yeah. phrase doesn't necessarily resolve yeah. those those contradictions i'm right. i'm thinking here about like okay what is the response then to people who are you know who, who are raging who yeah. Uh, yeah. and rightly so yeah. right if it's saying yes. like well you know it's not going to make it better then it's sort of like oh, what is right, right. you you um, arrive on the image of a burning police car yeah, which I'd love yeah, to hear yeah. more about. I, I literally start the book with the image of a burning police car I'm kind of like well we're just going straight in on this one <laughs> I'm not a, I'm not going to ease you into this this situation yeah. but I mean the fact is that like the you know the majority of Americans said they understood why people had burned down the police precinct in Minneapolis right that was a you know, Time Magazine poll or something like that. I don't remember which. Which, to be clear, is a kind of vengeance I stand behind. Yeah, obviously. no, and 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 I think there's there's a difference, right, between saying that, like, you know, setting the police car on fire, like rioting. There are kinds of riots that I totally understand. There are kinds of riots, like the ones that happened here recently, that are just racist pogroms, right? Right. Um, it it matters sort of who's doing it and why and to whom. Mm-hmm. Right? Because your rage can be targeted correctly. Your rage can be targeted at refugees living in a hotel that you somehow have this idea. And this is this is what vengeance looks like, right? Like that's um when you really think about it and it's just like, well, you're raging and and you may be grieving real things, but the people in that hotel didn't do it to you. And you trying to take it out on them will not solve anything. And that probably seems obvious to everyone who's listening to this. And there are probably a lot of people listening to this who won't go along with me and saying, also, putting a bunch of people in jail will also not fix the problem. But it won't. It hasn't. We've been doing it for a very long time. You know, we've got prison overcrowding in, in this country right now that, you know, they're either going to have to let people out or super speedy build new prisons or something. I don't know. And this... Um, the question of what do we do with rage and grief. And I think one of the things that I, I came through reporting this book really obsessed with was like, where do our movements make space for the feelings that don't lend themselves immediately to good organizing, right? What do we do when people show up just I, you know, Miriam described this this moment when the young people that she'd been organizing with in Chicago, one of their friends had been killed, and she just, you know, they they were just so nihilistic and it terrified her, and she didn't know what to do. And part of what she had to do was figure out, like, okay, what can we, where can I direct this so that they don't do something that hurts themselves, right? So that they don't. I don't know, steal a car and crash it into the police station, something like that would have been, you know, massively destructive so that they don't hurt themselves. So she came up with this, the We Charge Genocide Project and, you know, following in the footsteps of people who had done that in the 50s with Paul Robeson and, and all of that, um, you know, took a bunch of young people to the UN to say, hey, this is, this is you know, ongoing racist violence against us that is genocidal. But also... You know, you have to have the space for people to have those feelings in the first place and to really sit with them. And the sort of uncomfortable conclusion that I came up with while writing this book and that my therapist likes to remind me of all the time is that you kind of have to feel the feelings. You can't just like do a thing to make them go away. You can't turn back the clock. You can't make the thing never have happened. You can't take the kind of vengeance that would somehow make your feelings go away. Mm. It just doesn't work like that. And so how do we then build spaces as, say, the left, as a particular kind of movement, right? Um, and I talked about this with folks in Minneapolis who were labor organizers and who are community organizers and housing organizers. And I talked about this with um, Zia Mara from the Maria Fund in Puerto Rico, who mostly, you know, her day job is running a, a fundraising operation to rebuild after Hurricane Maria. Um and talking to people about like where do we put 
the grief and where do we how do we hold people in these emotions so that they can move through them to a point where they can sort of you know not to be crude but like get your head back in the game of of organizing strategically because you're not terribly strategic when you're raging sometimes you still know who the correct target is um which is the police station and not the refugee hotel but that's an interesting point, actually, because I think that might be uh, might be a bit controversial, right? Mm-hmm. Um, you quote Olifemi O Taiwo, who's yes. been on the show, of course, yes. um, to talk about his book Elite Capture, yeah. and him uh, saying that pain is a poor teacher, yeah. which it raises the question of what yeah. what grief can and can't teach us. Because, of course, yeah. I think we would we would kind of agree as well that yeah. you know it it might uh, in uh, Olifemi O Taiwo's words be a a poor teacher, but it's still, you know, there's there's still information there, and yeah. that's um, I'm kind of looking to uh, grapple with what after kind of completing this project, you think grief can and can't teach us because there is this what could be um, read as a sort of a flattening politics of yeah. grief that encompasses a kind of politics that yeah. we would agree with, and a kind of politics that we violently would disagree with. Yeah, and I I think that the thing is that I, I sort of come away with saying, like, I, I make some sweeping statements about grief in the beginning of the book, and mostly that everybody is going to grieve differently, which is such a cliche, but also true, right? That like, when my father died, my mother and my sister and I all had totally different relationships to what was going on. And we, in some ways, were like the last people that one another could talk to about it. Because it was incredibly different when you're even grieving the same person, right? You are always sort of grieving in horrible specificities. And sometimes that can make you a better person. Sometimes it can make you a worse one. Um, But what it does do is transform you. And I think on some level, I don't want to say like you are responsible for how that goes, but like how you are held is going to be responsible for how that happens whether you are able to get care and support is going to be change how that happens. Are you capable of talking about it, right? Like I I come down to masculinity for a reason in the deindustrialization chapter Mm -hmm. because masculinity is not a singular thing either, but like a working class masculinity is often very based in like we don't talk about our feelings, we don't complain, we just do the thing. Mm -hmm. And so what do you do when the thing that you just go and do you know, and and bite the bullet and go into the factory or go into the mine every day, and then that's gone. And and what do you do? And for some people, like Kevin Horan, who I I you know spoke to for the book, who had been a miner and then became a care worker, you know, you do find a way to sort of make sense out of things, find new senses of meaning. He's also very involved in like the Orgrave Justice campaign, so like, you know, has sort of made various forms of meaning out of the loss. And was able to move on. And there are other people who, you know, probably took part in those awful riots who might also have been former miners. Like it's not a given that having something horrible happen to you is going to make you react in any one specific way and certainly not in any one specific political kind of a way. And I think that means it it is even more important and even more incumbent upon us to be able to talk about it and to create the spaces to talk about it because that will give people places to make sense and make meaning out of it that then we can turn into a bigger, stronger, more powerful movement that can actually unfuck this death-dealing world that we live in. So let's talk more about that relationship between um, grieving and organizing, mourning and organizing, right? Yes. Um, There is, I think it's the Joe Hill, correct me yeah, if I'm wrong, jo- quote. Joe Hill, right. Don't Joe Hill's organize, Don't Mourn Organize. And then go. and Mother Jones is Pray for the Dead and Fight Like Hell for the Living, which is the one that I will come down on the side of. <laughs> right. Um, and, you know, you have the idea of uh, the invocation of activists who have uh, been killed more recently uh, on the lines of struggle, like yeah. Tortu Gita, who was resisting Cop City mm-hmm. in the US. Yeah. Um, you have signs saying like Tortu Gita Presente. Yeah. Um, what role does the kind of like the politicization 
of the dead, either in struggle or, you know, like at the hands more generally of these processes yeah. that we have been naming? What what role do you think that that plays in organizing uh, slash should play in organizing? I was so fascinated to learn when I was researching this book and I was sort of trying to look up the, the origins of things like Presente or um, the other chant that I talk about with like the is here sorry right. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah 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 but it, but it particularly comes from you know Italian and Spanish movements right and to learn that like Italian fascists also mourned their dead with presente right Interesting. um and so again the, the attachment to the dead can go in in several different directions right I, I think about Walter Benjamin and and you know even the dead will not be safe, safe from the enemy if he wins um and on some level like that's you know what it um what I think he meant by that, right, is is you cannot you can't sort of assume that this only goes one way. I'm thinking now about Jane McAlevey, who passed away very recently, um, who definitely mourned and organized throughout her life. And the lessons that I take from from Jane and from having known Jane um, might be different than people who like only read her work because like, I know Jane liked to have fun. I know Jane was a horse girl and, and she took me <laughs> riding on a beach once and it was amazing. And like, I thought about that stuff as, as like a reminder that she was not just, you know, and she would talk about going into soldier mode, right. And just putting her head down and, and doing the work and always doing the work and sort of exhausting herself doing the work. And that cancer, you know, she wrote about in her her memoir that like the first time that she was diagnosed with cancer, that like sort of forcing her to take a break for once in her life. And that, you know, that's that's a lesson we can take from Jane. Certainly we take from Jane like the need to always be thinking strategically. But also like you know, you can also take away that we need to have fun and we need to have spaces for care. And we, you know, Jane was really, really dedicated to the organizing of care workers. When I started working on this book, I was thinking about sort of fascism and how to write about it. And like, I end up not writing about it that much, but I do to some degree. And I remember hearing Adam Tooze on, I think it was Politics Theory Other, maybe, talking about, um, you know, Nazism coming out of a reaction to World War One and to this this sort of horrific mass death moment and him sort of saying that like, well, what's what's going on now isn't fascism like that because there has been no period of mass death. And I was like, what was COVID, my dude? Like, <laughs> you know, yeah, we we don't have wars the same way that, you know, World War One trench warfare was like a particularly horrific kind of thing that, you know, really did involve much of the world, largely because Europe had colonized much of the world. But what was COVID if not a globalized period of mass death, right, that that is not over and in its, you know, certain places is, is for real, for real not over because we've privatized all the vaccines. So that, again, like that fascism is sort of death cult, right, as invocation of the dead in that way is, yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't know how to say it any other way than like, you know, grief can go that way too. Right. And you can get into, you know, if, if fascism is anything, it's going beyond sort of rendering people ungrievable and actively celebrating their deaths. And this is what I see when I see Israeli soldiers these days, you know, making TikToks about the people that they've killed. And what can living through periods of mass death do to us? It can make us horrible people, or hopefully it can make us want to say never again and never again for everyone. Um, <laughs> yeah. that, that, you know. No, let's talk about that because, um, I mean, I think this is, this is a Gagi Bhattacharya line that I'm definitely yes. um, mumbling here, but it's it, – capitalism everywhere is always fascism right. somewhere, right? right when yeah, we're thinking exactly. about mm -hmm. um, the persistence of capitalism, we think about the persistence of yeah. organized um, mass death because that's kind of, you know, feature, not a bug, not to right, be too exactly. gauche about it. Um, and I think it's interesting um, to see um, how one accesses or how one is supposed to access uh, grief for people that you don't know, grief for people that, yeah. that you've never met. And yeah. usually publicly that is is through a veil of, or through, through the prism of innocence that yeah. we mentioned beforehand, which is why the language of martyrdom I find so interesting mm -hmm. in, in yeah. the way that um, Palestinians describe yeah. um, people who've been killed at the hands right. of the Israeli regime. Right. Yeah, and I, and I really found that 
a sort of fascinating word to to poke at because um, it was a Basam Saad's piece, I think, that I I quote where where he's talking about um, the way that like the word martyr really means witness, mm -hmm. and that it's conceptualized not as like an innocent, blameless victim, but rather as a witness to injustice, which sa says nothing about your innocence or guilt or what you may have done in your life, only that your killing was unjust and the killing around you is unjust and the broader system that you are in, you know, of Israeli occupation is unjust, that the colonization of your land was unjust, that you are in a struggle to right a wrong and therefore everyone who dies in that is a martyr, right? That the children, but also the people who go to war. Um, and the people who do the fighting. And that, that is, yeah, I, I find that an incredibly powerful concept, right? To think about like, this person is a witness to injustice, not that like, as always happens when the police kill someone in the US and, and the media goes and digs up their record to try to prove that they were no angel in the words of way too many reporters. Um, specific thinking of one New York Times story about Mike Brown, but like, in so many cases, right? And it's like, I don't care what right. Mike Brown had done. The punishment for exactly none of it is getting shot in the street and then left there for four hours. Right. You know, um, there's, there's, there's no world in which the punishment for even manufacturing en masse counterfeit $20 bills, let alone having used one at a convenience store, is being strangled to death by a cop. Right. Right. There's there's no world in which that is the punishment that we have elected to inflict, even in a country that does still have the death penalty. And I, you know, am horrified by all of that. But like, and here we are with capital punishment. Um, that yeah, that that question of sort of innocence is actually sort of spectacularly unhelpful. And when I think of solidarity, right, as a as a concept that means a lot to me as a labor movement person, I think about something that is different from whether I like this person, right? That that organizing in workplaces and in housing, right? Organizing tenants and organizing your coworkers. These are the people that capital has chosen for you. They are not the people you would have chosen for yourself necessarily, unless you work at some place like Navarra. Um, <laughs> right? We can work in some places and be lucky enough for these to be actually people that we care about and love. And I've had, you know, small media jobs where I loved my coworkers too. Right. Still hated the boss most of the time, except for one. Laura, <laughs> I still love you. Um, the exception that proves the rule. But we have to show up for those people whether or not we like them, right? And thinking about the miners in particular, um, because mining is so dangerous, like you you had to trust the guy next to you with your life, even if you didn't like him, even if you thought he was a, a jerk, even if he slept with your wife, you know, you still were in this place. Um, and it a lot of people sort of describe it as being like going to war, where your life is in each other's hands. And that's what solidarity means. Not that I want to be your friend and we want to go for a drink after work necessarily, although you probably still did. But like that in this moment, our interests are the same and our interests are bound up together. And that is not about whether we want to be friends. And one of the things that I think about when thinking about like a politics of care is, and it's actually, there's a, Oh, I'm trying to remember exactly how he puts it, because Aaron Bananov has a beautiful line about it in Automation and the Future of Work, weirdly enough, about like a vision of abundance where of, you know, that everybody is cared for regardless of their relationships, right? And mm -hmm. I'm, I'm absolutely butchering the way he writes it, which is much more beautiful than that. But it's not about whether you're a good person in that moment or whether I like you or whether you like me. It's about this shouldn't happen this way and there is an injustice here and there is something that we want to change about the world. And I want the world to be structured this way in part so that like nobody's ability to survive and get care is based on whether I like them or not or whether they like me or not, you know? I kind of want to talk about Jewish grief. This It's yeah. this concept that's been yeah. kind of, um, you know, niggling at me for, mm -hmm. um, you know, nearly a year now. Um, 
Have you too been stress baking, Carla? Um, I'm a because terrible I ba- baker. I, I'm a terrible baker, and of course, and can't eat gluten anyway. But um, I will um, happily spectate other people stress baking Hala as a as a sort of a redemptive act into I keep what meaning is to try a, to make a gluten free Hala into what is a horrendously inavigable. Uh, concept, or at least I find this a um, uh, sort of, or rather, an objectionable concept in the way it gets uh, levied. Yeah. Right. Um, I think it's it's Gabriel Winant's yes. uh, evaluation or con- conceptualization of Israel as a machine that converts grief into power or grief yeah. into violence yeah. more yeah. Um, specifically. And I think this specific this question of, I mean, what we're referring to here is uh, the ways in which, you know, after October 7th, there was this concept that suddenly f- feels like it kind of sprung up from nowhere of, of like kind of Jewish grief yeah. um, that obviously has like a much more storied history when yeah. we're thinking about the Shoah, but like um, in its specific iteration in terms of October 7th, I have extremely large question marks. Yeah. And I think this gets to a kind of broader question in the mm-hmm. book of like how the um, structure of feeling around grief subtends the creation of, mm. of imagined communities yeah mm. and um for better and for worse mm. mm-hmm. I, I kind mm-hmm. of love yes. to hear your thoughts on yes that. yeah I, I i i feel like i've picked on adam schatz a lot on this one because he wrote a piece in the the um new york review of books i think new york LRB, NYRB, I don't remember. Um, one of those. It was on the internet. <laughs> yes. Shortly after October 7th. And he had a line in it about like all Jews viscerally felt it when like this. And I was like, no, I didn't. <laughs> like, I, I just didn't. I, I, right, I, sorry. I'm not even trying to be like, I, I feel very, you know, I I know people who have friends who were kidnapped there. Like, I, I'm not trying to be like cruel about it. Yeah, it's not like a flippant thing. No, I'm not. I'm not like... You know, I'm not celebrating that people were taken hostage and killed, but like, I I did not, in fact, have some visceral trauma reactivated by 1,200 Jews being killed. Um, I did not feel like we were in Holocaust 2.0. That is not a particular way that like whatever epistemic trauma I might have, or epigenetic trauma, excuse me, very different word. Yeah. <laughs> um, whatever epigenetic trauma I might have was was not actually activated in that moment. And in fact, what I felt was, oh my God, Israel's going to level Gaza. That was my first reaction to seeing the photos and videos on October 7th was, oh, my God, the vengeance is going to be horrific. Yeah. And I don't think that makes me a bad Jew, actually, to not feel the connection only with people who share some sort of, you know, genetic trauma with me Um, to whatever degree that I believe in epigenetic trauma at all. um, Right. There's an asterisk around the science. Right. But um, but like... I, the moments that that was triggered for me, that that sort of feeling of like, these were our people, was watching a line of people marching south in Gaza, carrying everything they owned and waving white flags. And I was like, because that, that's what they did to us. You know, those moments. And it was not like who it is, but rather what is being done that pushes the buttons for me. You know, and I, I, um, Nathan Tankus had like a tweet that I, that sort of still haunted that was like, right, like as a, a, you know, the descendant of people who were killed in ghettos, like it's not for me to tell the people who are in the ghetto how to resist. And in this case, Gaza is the ghetto, right? Not Israel. Um, and that is the place where people have been walled up and forced to live and under, you know, incredibly strict rules. And like, yeah, yeah, that's what they did to us. That's what they did to us. It doesn't make it okay for us to do it to somebody else, especially once again, when the vengeance is misplaced, children. We are not doing this to Germans or anything. Not that it would be great to do it to, you know, Germans right now anyway, but at least there are probably some people still alive in Germany who took part in the Holocaust, you know? Yeah, it does it's, pr- it's, produce these sort yeah. of that strange um, epistemic uh, cul-de-sacs. <laughs> exactly. See, there we go. Correct use of that word. There we word. go. Um, whereby um, framing it as the same form of violence mm-hmm. kind of um mm-hmm. cropping yeah. up again and again yeah it almost ends up uh, like victim blaming the victims of the holocaust and i'm like hang on a second how do yeah. we get, how do we no, get but here? that that's that's what happens right and it it um so both of, both like jacqueline rose and jillian rose sort of wrote about this and i i went back to both of their writings on on israel and the holocaust and all of it um 
And, you know, there was this moment, um, I'm pretty sure this is in the book, where uh, the Israeli UN ambassador showed up wearing a yellow star, which is like, are you ab- absolutely not? Yeah. yeah. And then the the head or the director or something or other at, at the Israeli Holocaust Museum, like, put out a statement condemning him for doing that. But part of his statement was like, also, we are strong now, and so that will never happen again. And it's like, my dudes, the Holocaust didn't happen because Jews were weak. When we come to discussions of individual kind of unexceptionalized death, right? Of kind of uh, mass like my death. father's, yeah. Right. And we're thinking about um, losses to COVID, uh, losses to AIDS, losses to the kinds of nebulous, slow forms of violence through air pollution or land mm-hmm. pollution or water pollution. You come away from the book thinking like, you know, where are the statues? Where are the carvings? Where are the memorials? Where are yeah. the people, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, I'd love to know more about, I guess, how you're thinking about the political lives of, of these um, of these dead bodies and, yeah. and how yeah. memorialization is, uh, should work. Yeah, I, I was really struck by the fact that the first statue I saw to COVID and still the only statue I've seen to, to um, the losses from COVID is in Barnsley. It's in a mining town, right? Wow. It's in the, I, w- I saw it the same time that Navarra's Craig Gent took me there, actually, um, to, you know, to see that when we were going to the miners union hall so that I could meet with Chris Kitchen, right? And it is, it is not an accident, I think, that a place that is used to memorializing working class death from the mining industry also memorialized working class death in the, in the pandemic and you know dedicate something to the essential workers and when i went to the durham miners gala that year you know the theme was essential workers and the people who were speaking from the stage were talking about you know being and representing essential workers and healthcare workers and you know service workers right and i think we who know how to memorialize one kind of catastrophe are better at doing it again, that mm-hmm. that is a thing that sort of grief, again, like grief can either make you turn inwards and become really, really selfish and terrible, or it can make you turn outwards and see the rest of the world. And I, I think about like, Craig and I were just actually having this conversation on, on our podcast about, um, you know, when my, when my father died, and again, like sort of unspectacular death, probably, you know, equally due to cigarettes and working too damn much. Um, but, you know, in his 70s from, you know, long illness, like all of those things, um, and how absolutely that upended my life. And the people who reached out to me in the aftermath, some of whom were close to me, some of whom were really not, some of whom were like, you know, brief acquaintances that I knew from, you know, whatever. I think of one person that I knew from like Occupy Wall Street that I didn't even know he had my number Mm -hmm. to text me to say like, hey, I heard what happened. I'm going to be at Labor Notes. Let's talk, you know. And I couldn't sort of turn around and reciprocate to him, right? Because his dad was already dead. So instead, you have to sort of pay it outward. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, I guess this book is also my attempt to pay it outwards even on an even broader scale. But like, also just very particularly, you know, I sort of reached out to people in the aftermath who's, you know, friends of mine whose fathers died. In some cases, I knew them. Um, Laura Clausen, um, her father, Dan Clausen, was a, just a legendary labor sociologist. And I really liked Dan. And he had been really supportive of my work. And like when he died, it was, you know, I was also sad, but not nearly as bereft as, as you know, his actual daughter. And, you know, it was like, in that case, I can really grieve with you because I know your dad was really special. I can't imagine what it feels like to have lost him. And, and you know, Dan Clausen Presente, man. Um, <laughs> third time I start crying. And then there were people whose parents I had never met, you know, or people whose sisters, people's, whose, you know, cousins, friends that I have never met, I didn't know. But it was like, I had this thing inside of me now that I could share that was like, I have lived through this and you will too, but oh my God, is it going to suck? And it's, it's going to be so hard. And also like, it will change you in ways that you cannot imagine. And I can't tell you what they're going to be. And all I can do is say like, I see you. And maybe, you know, at bottom, that's sort of why I had to put my story in this book. It's just to be like, 
I see this. And to sit with the people that I interviewed for it um, and to sort of sit with them as long as they needed me to, you know, and to keep talking as long as we could keep talking and just to, to see them, you know, in that moment, um, whether their losses were similar to mine or whether their losses were like unimaginable to my life. And that kind of memorialization, like I think we need so much more of and we need like the interpersonal and also the political, right? We need to say that like it mattered that like millions of people died of COVID and we've just been told to go back to work like nothing happened. That concept of seeing death, seeing the dead, like bearing witness to kind of like um, borrow a concept from a Palestinian struggle puts me in mind of this idea of haunting, which is throughout the mm -hmm. book. And um, haunting ghost stories always fascinate me as a way in which we can recognize violence as such, especially in frameworks or places or relationships, which are supposed to keep us safe or supposed to be exempt from violence, right? Like prisons- Or just supposed to be normalized, right? right. Yeah. Like prisons supposed to be like very normal, right? It's supposed yeah. to like protect this kind of very like nebulous idea of us from this um, nebulous idea of violence, right? right, right um, exactly. But like when they're located, they're vacated rather, right. um, suddenly a million ghosts spring forth with like stories of violence. I'm like, right. mm, that's- Right, right. And, and, and that like violence is- individualized and, and locked away, right? Rather than like is a structure that is produced by the system we live under. Um, and so like that violence is these people who like, if you look at who prisons lock up, then violence is working class black and brown men mostly, right? More women than used to be, but still mostly working class black and brown men is, is who prisons lock up in this country and in the US. Um, and right? Um, and we are the leaders. I mean, well, the US is the leader by far, but you know, Britain's trying to catch up, guys. You're right. trying. Doing your best. Yeah. And, and you know, I, again, I live in New Orleans and I ended up writing a piece for Lux Magazine last year about um, the haunted history tours in my neighborhood because I live in the French Quarter, as earlier mentioned. Please don't stalk me. And I live in near a couple of buildings that are very popular stops on most of the haunted history tours. And so if I leave my house at sort of sundown, um, there are just like tour groups on like every corner and I have to sort of like shove them out of the way to get out of my door. Mm. And the, you know, what is, what is the thing that haunts New Orleans? Well, it's slavery guys. It's, it's chattel slavery right. and the, you know, horrors of that, which were incredibly mundane. Right. Um, and my, I mean mundane as in like they were every day and they were widely distributed and they were products of the system, not for of individual bad people. But what the Haunted History Tour does is it tells you ab about a couple of individual bad people, right? It tells you of, about Madame LaLaurie, played by Kathy Bates in uh, the American Horror Story series, Um and it takes you to the Lollary Mansion and it says this woman and her husband had this like slave torture chamber, um, which like at least some of this is historically backed up with some facts, but it's always embellished on the tours, right? And this this person is like the the bad slave owner and she was so bad that even all the other slave owners who were like, you know, they were nicer to their slaves, right? right. Um, you know, but they didn't have a torture chamber where they like experimented on people. So, you know, they're they're better. Um, and she was worse. And again, you see the like the putting of the violence into the body of this one woman, of course, um, that therefore we can condemn her and we know that she's awful and we know that this building is haunted because of the specific horrors that went on there. And not that every freaking building in the city of New Orleans that was built before, you know, 1865 should also be haunted. Right. You know, and a decent amount of them, although some of them were washed away by the storm. So, you know, you're, you're just like, right, like the, the, everything is haunted. Capitalism is haunted, right? It is, it is um, as Marx said, right, dripping with blood and dirt. And that is just true and real. And if you start to dig into the facts of it, well, you'll depress yourself like I did. But uh, wait, I'm, <laughs> it puts me in mind of um, Arundhati Roy's book capitalism a ghost story yeah exactly and particularly in exactly. the way in which there is this sort of the specter of workers compensation mm -hmm. through the book yeah, um, yeah, yeah. this sort of kind of 
understandable if horrifying enforced calculus of, of yeah. money and compensation yeah. for not just lives but like yeah. eyes lungs limbs like how mm-hmm. much is it mm-hmm. worth if exactly. your kid gets cancer from right. drinking like from yeah. drinking bad water right if your children are in flint which still doesn't have clean water right um yeah nate holdren is the the person who i was quoting on the workman's comp stuff he wrote this wonderful sort of horrifying book about the history of of workers' compensation and the the change from sort of individual trials to this very like actuarial system of like this is how much a leg is worth, this is how much an eye is worth, if this is how much money you make, this is how much your life is worth, you know, that kind of cold calculus of it, right? Um, or the story that is in um, if you watch uh, Harlan County, USA, the the wonderful wonderful documentary about um, the seventies version of the mine wars. And you hear this old miner telling this story of um, being told to be careful with the mule because if, don't let the wall fall in on that mule because I, I've got to buy the mule. And the guy's like, what if the, the wall falls in on me? And he's like, oh, well, you know, I got to buy the mule. I can just hire another man. That is, in a nutshell, when, when Marx talks about labor being doubly free, that's what he means right there, right? It's like the wall can cave in on you. And they don't care. Or the miner who led the tour that we went on in the the mining museum up in Yorkshire who said, like, you know, here's where the mine face would have been and this is what it would have been like when I worked here. And only nine people were allowed to be in any one of these sort of spaces by the open face at, at, at a time. And why do you think that was? And people made a couple of guesses. And he was like, well, no, because if, if more than 10 people died at once, then they would have to close the mine because that counted as a major disaster. But if fewer than 10 people died, then they could just keep going. And it's like, imagine going to work every day knowing that like those kinds of calculations have already been made about how much your life is worth. Yeah. When thinking about grief as this enormous kind of unthinkable collective hyper object structure of feeling type thing, <laughs> but also a very personal experience, yeah. the thing that yeah. That asserts itself for me is of course climate grief or yeah. solastalgia, right? This yeah thing that is at once for me unthinkable and something that I'm thinking about constantly. What do you make of, I guess, calling climate grief, grief? Yeah, I kind of think that there are, there are definitely places and people who have experienced actual grief because they've actually lost something, right? That like when I, you know, I went to uh, Puerto Rico to talk to people who had lived through Hurricane Maria um, and they are grieving something real, right? That I talked about Katrina earlier, right? That like we are grieving something that has happened that is like horrific Um, as opposed to people for whom it's still mostly largely like anticipation and and fear um, and anxiety maybe is a good term. Mm. Um, That it is, you know, I, I think it's as, as, you know, your friend and mine, Jay Chaudhary, would remind us, right? The future is here. It's just unevenly distributed. Mm-hmm. And so some people are living in the present of climate change, right? Um, there was flooding in Brazil this summer um, that was horrifying to look at, right? Like the, there's, there's the now of it. Um, there are forest fires in the U.S. that are, you know, we're apparently turning the moon red the other night here as we're sitting here recording. Um, so I was trying to look at pictures of the moon because I couldn't see it from where I was and I was sad about it. It's a bit of an on-the-nose kind of Star Warsy moment from yeah. the writers of reality, isn't it? You know, I, the, the real on-the-nose one was a couple of years ago during the, the drought in Europe when um, the, like, unexploded Nazi ordnance was being found at the bottom of, like, rivers and, like, you know, old submarines and things, that that was a thing, that that, that one really well, stuck with me. This is the first time um, hearing of that, lovely. God, or geez. there is, you know, there was the the year that I learned about um, fires that are so intense that they generate thunderstorms, which then, of course, create lightning, which creates more fires, which then, like, so they were, like, pyrogenetic storms. So, you know, climate change just has, like, a million different ways to give me nightmares, mm. right? Um, and I had left New Orleans before Katrina hit, but I, you know, it was it was real to me because it was this place that I had lived. Um, I was in New York when Hurricane Sandy hit. I was living in Crown Heights, which as the name might imply, did not flood because it was higher. Um, and I, you know, went out and did volunteer work in the immediate afterwards days and, you know, was cooking food and bringing it to people and then going out with, you know, organizers who were going door to door to see if people were okay in the places that had flooded. 
um, you know, I, I did a lot of writing about um, some of the healthcare workers that were going door to door out there. Um, yeah, so like you know, I have I have lived through some climate catastrophes, and every time I leave New Orleans in hurricane season, my friends remind me to like take everything important with you, uh, take anything that you can't lose with you because uh, you you know it could not be here when you go back. Um, you know, and and I have a pretty portable lifestyle at this point in time. So like, I will not feel like a climate refugee if something does happen, if another Katrina comes to New Orleans and I am displaced by it because I'm used to moving all the time. Mm. But I I would be, right? Um, and again, so like the knowledge, it, it's not really me yet, but it could be at any time. And I did choose to move back to New Orleans. So, you know, these are life choices that I have made for myself. But, you know, to to sort of live with that all the time, whatever we call it as a feeling, right? It is, it is a jumble of them that are, um, yeah, that are, are, again, going mostly sort of unacknowledged unless you can afford to pay for private therapy. I think there's that um, question of the spirit of Joe Hill <laughs> presente, right? Yeah. Of uh, don't mourn organized, particularly um, in the case of the actual current reality of climate catastrophe right exactly right? um and it, it brings to mind uh, you writing about the experience of grief as also this sort of strange intriguing warped space of, of possibility right this yeah. is the absolute break mm -hmm. with the past yeah. but it's also an absolute break with the past yeah and and that i think um so i, I you know in the, the beginning of the book i start out with some sort of um, again, sweeping statements about grief. Um, one of them, the first one is grief is a rupture, right? And I, I was thinking about that. And then I read um, China Mayville's book on the Communist Manifesto. And he, he really spends a lot of time pulling at the idea of rupture as a concept of revolution, that this is something that we sort of can't imagine what the other side of it will be because we are not there. Mm. Um, and that grief is, is like that in that way, that it... Um, yeah, that it will change you in ways you cannot really imagine. And it will wipe out, and my, my second sort of statement is that grief is about the future, and that it will change the futures that you can imagine. And I, I found this really, really strong in my own experience, right? My father was not a part of my day-to-day -day life. You know, we talked once a week, maybe, um, often less than that. And still, when he died, I suddenly I was like, I, what does tomorrow look like? Mm. You know, and it's not like he would have been there for it. But like, it's also not like he wouldn't. Right, exactly. And, and still, it was, you know, I still had to sort of figure out a different way to live my life. And I think that part of it is, is the, you know, and the bit where I beef with Freud, right? But like this, this, yeah, this this need to reimagine sort of everything. It does create sort of space to become something else. And I my last little prescription thing in there um, is that grief is a collective becoming, that it is something that we that will change us and that it isn't something that happens to you alone even though it can feel incredibly isolating because it is probably the most universal human experience of all, right? That we will all die and we will all have people we love die unless you somehow have managed to never love anybody, which is impressive really. But, you know, this is something that will happen to all of us and we can let that be a thing that brings us together or we can let it be a thing that turns us into the kind of people who want to set fire to a hotel because there are refugees living in it. Sarah, thank you so much for coming to talk to us. <laughs> thank you. Support independent journalism and set up a regular donation to Navara Media from just £1 a month. Head to navara.media forward slash support. Thank you.